good stuff. Good okay. stuff. I think I get the setup. Sounds good. So how you doing, man? Looks like you got. So this is a, this is the gym, uh, home gym, eh? Yeah, it's uh, the gym, the office, the place I spend most of my time. The sanctuary. Kinda, yeah. Yeah, and do you do all your um, YouTube videos and social media stuff? You said you were streaming later today. Yeah, I've uh, been streaming for the last few months. Uh, I dual stream on on Twitch and on YouTube. So it just a few workouts a week, but it's kind of becoming more and more. I just I like doing it. It's fun. Gives me a, a little bit of an outlet. Twitch is like, isn't Twitch um, a video game one, right? Do they yeah, know you do but that? They have a they have a category called IRL, the in real life category. Yeah. And so I've actually networked with a couple other of the fitness streamers, and uh, it's a, it's a thing. No shit, because I got some yeah. buddies. Um, I know I got some buddies like way deep into the video game scene, and they're on like Twitch. I'm like, what the hell is Twitch? And then you hear like a. Uh, like, I, I watch UFC, and guys like Rampage yeah. Jackson are, like, all on Twitch. It's like, really? What the fuck is Twitch? What is I, It's just only live, though, or? It's a it's a live streaming website. Yeah, you go on. I'm a gaming fan. I don't actually have much time to play games myself, but I yeah. I watch more competitive esports than I do probably real sports. So oh, shit, I, you do. I know, I'm in the, yeah, that's. There's no dragons in football, man. What are you gonna do? <laughs> no shit. Wow. So you watch like, uh, like football, like like e football and stuff. I watch. Uh, I watch competitive League of Legends, Call of Duty, uh, Injustice Two. Recently, I've been getting into the fight game genre. I don't have time to play myself, uh, so I like to watch. I like to watch other people at the high level competition do it. It's. It feels normal to me. It doesn't seem weird, but when I talk to people about it that aren't aware, they're like, "What? You just watch other people play video games? Yeah, but they're really good." The thing is, like, um, it's there's a lot of there's a huge following for this. Like, this isn't like it's somewhat oh, yeah. niche, but there's like these guys. First off, there's some of these people. Like, um, my brother-in-law is from Sweden. He said there's a guy from Sweden who has a YouTube channel. We're talking forty million people watching, subscribed, and he makes That's Felix. That's What's Felix. That? That's PewDiePie. It's you know, you know, you know who, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, he's got. Well, he's got. He's the number one most subscribed to YouTuber on the platform. Fifty-five million subscribers. Wow. Uh, he's. Yeah. So, so my my numbers are outdated. I remember my uh, my yeah my brother-in-law telling me about it. He's from Sweden back in the day. But these guys make there's a huge following with this man. Like this oh, is yeah. a, and and they have like a, don't they pack stadiums and shit? And people show up and watch. Yeah, they have thing. They have. Uh, for YouTube in general, but for in specifically something like League of Legends or Dota 2, StarCraft, those kinds of games. I believe League of Legends, the World Championship match last year, had more concurrent viewers than like World Series or like the NBA Finals. It's yeah, it's just crazy. easier because it's already it's all digital. You're if you're trying to advertise on it, you can just you can throw an advertisement up on the screen at any time. You don't have to worry about referees because all the all the rules are like, That's true. That's embedded true. into the game. It's just it's yeah. just easier. A bunch of uh, NBA teams have actually been buying them out. Rick Fox from the NBA is has a team, uh, an entire franchise called Echo Fox. It's online. I, I nerd out about this stuff all the time, man. It's this is crazy, man. No shit. You know yeah. what? I'm gonna retire powerlifting and just digitally powerlift. <laughs> I think. Who knows, man? I, I've made I've probably made more money stream and I don't make a whole lot but I've made more money streaming than I have from lifting. So. No shit. So how did you how did you set up a because this fascinates me. We earlier today we were just talking to um, Russell Russell, you know, yeah. jacked up black dude, bodied up the whole time, right? So he's got a great um, online following, and um, he was talking about like how he makes his money on social media as well. So how is it? Do you, you get paid by Twitch or YouTube or? I, for me, I'm kind of still in the small, small fish territory in the big pond. But you go through and you have uh, donation systems, or on YouTube, there's the super chat when you're live streaming. And if someone feels so inclined, uh, they can they can push a little button and it pops up and there's a little alert on the screen and everybody gets to celebrate that uh, someone's that bench over there. Yeah. I I had a little garbage throwaway kind of bench that I've been using for the last three or four years and. We set kind of a goal in the the little community in my little streaming community that said, "Hey, if we, 
you know, any donations or anything are going to go back into this. I don't live a very uh, materialistic life, so any kind of money I make anyway goes into the things that I care about and tries to free me up for more time to work with my own athletes and uh, to not worry. I'm, I'm terrible at like charging people in the first place, so this is a great system because yeah, they yeah. wanted to, like your, your gym needs to be upgraded. So we bought that bench, and I let them name him. His name's Timothy, Timothy the Bench Press. <laughs> so... No shit, man. And, yeah, uh, it's so, a different kind of culture. So Twitch, is it? Is there a lot of powerlifters or people who watch that stuff on Twitch? Not a... I'd say it's there's not a whole lot of powerlifters. There's a lot of general fitness that goes on over there. A lot of gamers who are interested in being healthier mm -hmm. and doing that kind of stuff. I think of the lifters that I know who have tried to play around with some of the streaming... Uh, most of the most of the elite level guys would probably find that <laughs> it may take away a little bit from their focus on their training sessions. Mm. Uh, I've got pretty severe ADHD though, so it doesn't throw me off. I've been having to figure out how to focus in for a particular set for for a long time, even if I'm distracted in between. So it does make the workouts a little bit longer. Last night we went for about five hours, and Holy I was shit. I was dragging I was dragging by the end of it. I had, Pause squats and then bench press and then regular squats and the second round of squats where I was I need I was, you know stream lend me your energy come on yeah, 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 yeah. Me. no shit because no. you've been doing I took a look at your YouTube you've been doing YouTube for a, how long have you been doing YouTube a long time years right like five six years <sighs> oh uh, probably closer to eight um, holy smokes man yeah I think I started when I was finishing up with high school graduated high school in 08, so. And when you first I, started, what kind of level were you in terms of powerlifting? When you first started your YouTube? Uh, bah, 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 bah. I think at that time I had gotten sponsored by Universal Nutrition. So I've been, I mean, I started training super young, younger than most other lifters, I think. I started when I was like 10 years old. Holy so I've been doing this for 17 years. Wow. And my first, so I started in. Uh, what, 1999 is when I started like being pretty intentional about exercising and working out. And I think my first powerlifting competition was in 2005. And so I did that for a few years. And then after maybe four years of specifically competing in powerlifting, I got picked up by Universal Nutrition, Animal, the Animal Pack Company. So the mm -hmm. guys who make that and, uh, I think right before then I had started just documenting my own training on YouTube just for myself just raw footage of different lifts and and putting that up there for a long time I competed single ply for most of the beginning not like well not like not like they have now with like IPF single ply or like down in Texas that their high school single ply is is just a world different than you know what it what it was up here in Washington, but uh, that's how I started out, and then eventually moved towards raw lifting. And I don't know, I've probably been on YouTube since about two thousand two thousand nine, maybe. That's a long time posting. So the people following you, they watched you progress as a lifter. Because right now you, how many you? Because you broke the American deadlift record, correct? Uh yeah. And, uh, a few. I, I still hold it for the junior single. Li I don't even know. The records get so convoluted. I've been competing in so many federations across the years because uh, USAPL and IPF weren't weren't nearly the size they are now no. when I started competing. So it was when I started competing. Those are the places you went when you couldn't hang in the other federations. And you wanted to go somewhere where they gave you the strictest rules so that no one could lift any real weight so that you felt better about your bad total. That's kind of how <laughs> it was at the start. And it's and now I compete exclusively in that federation. So I think it's really grown, especially in the last four or five years. It's become one, way more competitive. But uh, there was a time I competed in SPF, UPA, USPA, USPF, which is the federation UP, USPA was before. They changed the F to an A. No shit, uh, fucking A. So, yeah, uh, WABDL, World Association of Bench and Deadlifters. I Dead remember Lifters. those guys. I remember those guys. Yeah, yeah are they still. Oh, they're still going. They're no still shit. going. No yeah. shit, man. Yeah, so you are from definitely from back in the day. I started 
2007. And um, yeah, it's a totally different ball game back in the day. Um, the IPF obviously was only equipped. Um, so you a lot of, and then way smaller. Powerlifting in general is way smaller. So you mm -hmm. see basically, when, when powerlifting first started, you started when nobody knew what powerlifting was. If you told your friends you were powerlifting, like, what's powerlifting? Really, they think it's bodybuilding. And now it's like, social media wise, like you were on social media powerlifting before anybody was on social media powerlifting. Because now everybody is on social media powerlifting. You can't go on right. Instagram and bump into somebody who's not squatting and hashtag powerlifting, even if they're bodybuilding or just gym guys, powerlifting oh, and, and doing their thing. And, and guys, Britain, uh, I always find it, and people who I care about deeply do this, but whenever I go to someone's Instagram profile and it has like their total or their lifts in their, yeah. in their bio, I'm like, oh, you're, okay. I'm, I'm old and crotchety, I guess. That's how I feel sometimes. <laughs> What, you don't like I that? The do totals that. in there? I, I, it's not that I don't like it. It's just one of those things that uh, my total doesn't define me. My impact on other people and the, my interactions that's define true. me. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, some people put a total to that. It's not even a real total. It's something they hit in the gym. Those are their gym numbers and shit. Oh, my gosh. You'll, it's it's hard. I mean, if your, lifts aren't, if your lifts aren't legit and backed up with video, I think it's almost impossible to really get away with that these days. You can't really be a, a gym a gym warrior or else people are going to come and get all sassy at you. I had a squat sassy, one time. I love the sassy. Yeah. yeah. You don't be all these sass boys. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of sass mouth out there. You know what? You could be hella legit and people will still come at you sassy. We post obviously um, squat champs, uh, king of lifts and how much you bench. We post like world champion dudes. People still mm -hmm. get on there and talk shit. It's like, dude, these so dudes... He's using too much of his back, not enough of his legs. Yeah. All right, settle down there, like, Junior. Do you know who you're talking about? Exactly. It's me. Yeah. Like, Holy shit. Oh, my gosh. I'll have... I'll, I'll be streaming and... You know, I'll post a video and I, I kind of... I feel troll-proof. I don't think that it really affects me too much because I've never run into somebody who's as harsh on me as I've been on myself in the past. Like, your squat sucks. You know, I practice it so much, man. Yeah, it's yeah, rough. Yeah. So who does your programming? Uh, currently, I actually my fir the first coaches I've ever had. I did it for years and years on my own. Learned a lot of things by doing it wrong. And currently, I have two coaches. And I think you had Hanny on yeah. Hanny Jezreli, and then Eric Bodhorn, who's another guy from TSA. Uh, we I've got the two coach system because sometimes I can be a stubborn little boy, and uh, it's it's nice to have them be able to overrule me. Yeah, yeah. So, so would they do? The, one guy does the um, programs, and another guy will be the guy watching you, or how how would that work? No, it's it's a dual effort. It's a dual effort. I they I can usually I can usually tell who wrote the program for that block, or but I know they collaborate with it, so they'll Skype call each other and talk about me behind my back, whatever. I'm fine, <laughs> and then they'll uh, and then they'll send me out what they want me to do, and I will. You know, ask questions or clarifications, uh, challenge them sometimes. I, I try really hard to be coachable because I'm a, I'm a strength coach too, so I know what it's like when you have an athlete who thinks they know everything. Mm -hmm. And even though I think I know everything, I try to forget it sometimes so that right. I can do what they want me to do. That's one of the things with the internet, man. Um, like you see people compete maybe one year, and all of a sudden now they're taking on clients, and they know everything, and they're like telling people what they should and shouldn't be doing. It's like... How many yeah. competitions have you had? How long have you been doing this? It's been a year. How do you know everything I mean, already? There, there's a chance that they could just be lucky and have gotten it all right. I think my biggest strength as a coach and as a lifter is is how many times I've uh, kind of been humbled by reality. Mm -hmm. I and and run into those problems where I've I've done things the wrong way or messed up and and can look back and say, oh, there's no room for ego here because I was, I was real dumb just just <laughs> not as long ago as I wish it was sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing where experience really gets you that. Only experience can you, because if you, um, a lot of these people, if you come on early and you get early success because it works for you, you think this is the way it goes. But the longer right. you've been around competing and like you said, you make some mess, you mess up here and there, that's when you really start realizing like only through your, your trials and tribulations, like, wow, you could really veer off. Or, or when you're coaching a variety of different people, you see a lot of different things, right? Well, works for one right. guy totally might not work for somebody else. 
Well, the cra- and to go even deeper in that, sometimes the thing that works best for somebody at one stage of their training isn't going to be the best thing for them at a different stage, or something Very that you weren't ready for at this point might be exactly what you need for this, and so it, it, when people say, like, if it's working for you, keep doing it, awesome. At some stage, it comes down to knowing where to put progression in, knowing where to change certain variables, and and kind of recognizing when when you need to add complexity or you need to add things or take things out. It's it's not once you figured it out, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be able to progress on it. You can't just run the same program over and over again for twenty years mm-hmm. and expect your your body to react the same way that it did the first time or the tenth time. It, 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 there's more nuance in this. It's we have a lot of scientific basis. We have a lot of uh, a lot of things that are supported through understandings of biomechanics, biochemistry, uh, kinesiology. There's all these different aspects that are really helpful, but each individual lifter is an individual lifter, and their rate of progression or their own strengths and weaknesses or injury history, all these other things come into play, and it's. I, that's why I love coaching so much. That's why I love. I used to love programming for myself, and then I decided to give it to to Eric and Hanny so that they can they can stress for me on that, so I can spend my time trying to be an athlete and then focusing on the programming of my own lifters. Is that like the easiest? Um, is that way you kind of hit it off where you could be like? Because it's true where if you're programming for yourself, it is a lot on the brain sometimes. Sometimes it's easier to be like, here, you take the wheel, I'll focus on lifting, and then I don't because you could. You could do edits on your own program and like push it more than you should, or nobody's checking you. You know things like emotional that, right? emotional responses. One hundred percent. Huge. Yeah. It's huge, especially when you're emotion. Because there's no way to not be subjective with your own. If you have goals, if you have any kind of competitive goals or personal growth goals, uh, you tend to it, it is deeply personal for you, and especially something like weightlifting, where it's your own body. Mm-hmm. It's 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 this thing that is no one else, uh, there's not a whole lot of other sports where it's just you and the the skill that you're working on is your own ability to move in space. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's simple but it's complicated and I think being able to remove your, your subjectivity and give it to someone else who can be a little bit more unbiased and objective and, and uh, see things maybe a little bit more in line with reality is, mm-hmm. is helpful at times. It lets you just focus on doing what you need to do in that moment, not having to think too far ahead or dwell too much on the past. It's give it to someone else. And I think the program's the easiest part of that. It's usually the kind of the emotional support that comes from having a, having someone else there whose job it is, is to make sure that you meet your goals and it's it's a team effort it it turns an individual sport into into a team mentality which is easier to get yourself up for sometimes do you do you train alone do you train with other people um when you're actually doing the lifting always alone uh i mean i'll i'm not opposed to visiting with some strong friends yeah like i got my internet friends sometimes if uh someone comes up bryce came up uh, a few months ago we we met up in seattle and and hung out. I've done some sessions if Brandon Camel comes up a few times. Um, but just around here, it's it's just me and the stream boys. So. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And when you, so it was interesting when you're talking about like how you can get emotionally attached to numbers sometimes. When you're doing, when you get the programs, is it based off of a percentage or is it RPE? And what I've noticed with RPE, and I don't know if you, you find the same, sometimes where like a percentage is a percentage. They give you a number, you work with that number. Cool. The good thing about that is it's not, you're not going to, yourself or your client going to push further than the number you got given. On the flip side, who knows what happened that day or whatever, whether or not that number should be that number. But on the RPE end, how often do you or you know as clients pushing those RPEs where it's like, man, that was not an eight. You know, the door's too open. Right. I... Eric and Hanny use kind of, we use kind of a combination approach for me. Uh, for my lifters, I I do weekly updates. I send them their programming one week at a time, and I demand that they I demand <laughs> that they give me feedback so that I adjust percentages for them, and I become their regulation. So if if this certain percent, I don't care. The percent doesn't matter to me. It's it's 
we're basing it in like your training max doesn't matter to me. I care about how the weights are moving in this range. And it's just relative to that. If you move this percentage better than I thought you would, we're going to jump up more percent. So I'm basically giving you more weight on the bar. I'm in a, kind of an approach. I think one of the things that happens, and I love Mike, Mike Tashir, RP. I think it's a great tool. Mm-hmm. And if used properly and you have a person who, who psychologically and like emotionally fits that, who they, because some lifters need a little bit more, more flexibility where some lifters need some of that flexibility taken away. I, I often joke with Eric and Hanny that a lot of times their biggest role for me is to pull the reins because I'm going to get the work done if they give it to me, but I, yeah. I need someone to be there. I'm like, hey, I'm feeling good today. Yeah, how about we just do something like, a, let's let's just AMRAP 700 pounds. Like, well, maybe we don't need to do that yeah. today. <laughs> uh, yeah. I actually was listening to another podcast recently, and I it was an interesting, it was a Joe Rogan had... Uh, da, 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 doctor, I love Joe some, Rogan. Dr. Something Something. He's a, yeah, Dr. Something Something. I know him. Yeah, yeah Dr. Something Something. Yeah. I'll, I'll check, the, check the description for that guy's name. Yeah. Anyway, it was he was describing some different personality types as being uh, bakers or cooks. And I thought it was really helpful from a coaching perspective because in baking, it's very precise. You don't, you don't just kind of wing it with it with baking. It's very very particular about the the temperature that you're working with and and the ingredients are measured out exactly you don't just kind of you don't just kind of make it up Mm -hmm. where a cook is kind of like oh what do we have to work with do all sorts of these things and and they work better with the system like i'm gonna end up with an omelet but how i get there is one thing where this other person's trying to do a cake and it's like that needs to be precise yeah and so these lift these personality types i I think a, a way to think about it is someone who is a, a baker, someone who really needs to have things lined. You know, a lot of times with lifters who are less experienced or with lifters who are more experienced but slightly neurotic, they need more structure. They need you to tell them exactly what it what is needed for them to succeed. They want numbers. They want something specific. I know exactly this is on the bar. These are what my warm-ups look like. This yeah. is how it's supposed to go where then you have some people that are a little bit more into the idea of of a system or the cook where you give them an RPE and say, here's kind of the range we're looking for. This is the desired training effect. We trust you to move the weights around until you're in around that training effect instead of necessarily predicting what it, what weight should be on the bar for that. And so I think both are valuable and helpful. I tend to find a lot of younger guys who have uh, not gotten hurt much in the sport tend to really love RPE and they tend to really they tend to really push their RPEs and maybe not have the best time being objective in their ratings mm-hmm. but a lot of times you can see even the ratings are different from lift to lift or uh, the fall off can be pretty extreme I've got a I've got kind of a bum shoulder so when I bench press my RPEs like it looks my it looks easy until I until I can't do it and that's true too it's, that's another factor man that word some dudes, they look like they're grinding, whatever the lift is, but like I, we just posted a uh, Dan Green had a, he did like something stupid. It was like 800 first, conventional for four reps, where oh, he okay, RPE you know. 10 on the first <laughs> rep and then he does three yeah, more. Yep. Exactly, man. It was RPE 10, the first rep. I was like, fuck me, he did four of these. And then yeah. by the end, so he put like, I'm thinking like he's, he, he probably isn't RPE 10 yet, but he probably could have kept going. But damn, if every single rep, man, it would, you would think, you don't got any more left in. That's the last one. Yeah. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's, that's me on my squats. That's when I'm squatting. It'll look like I'm done because I don't want to do any more reps. Someone's like, what was that rating? Like a nine? Like, no, I could I could literally have done four more, but I wouldn't have wanted to do four yeah, more. Yeah. Was, that a, was that at nine because that's how many I wanted to do? Or if I've got my... You know, my friends and family here with a cycle with their gun to the head say, do two more. I'd probably figure out a way to do two more. That's real that? RPE. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. family's on the line. What's your real RPE? And, and so. that's where, um, I remember uh, Joey Flex was training me for um, the Nationals. And I was telling him, like, if I, so if I have a normal RPE where, like, a normal set, you just walk into the squat rack and you hit it. Or if I start pacing like a son of a bitch, start playing those mental games, like we were just talking about the gun to your head situation. All of a sudden, I got a hell of a lot more in me. So the RPEs, you could change your own RPE. So it's kind of like, but how does that affect your central nervous system? 
in terms of what it takes out and how you're fatiguing down the road, etc. Peaking wise, so you could like there's intangibles though, and some people are emotional lifters. Some guys are even keel straight across the across the board. Some guys like are like screamer Manuels, where they could change the game with how amped up they get, right? And then the RP system, it's like, well, is it the baseline or is it when I get super crazy and then all of a yeah. sudden, you know what I mean? And what does that do for yeah. the nervous system? Yeah. There's a lot of variables yeah. with it. There is. And that's why I think even Mike has talked about it. He said it's it's if training is the rifle RPE is like a scope. It gives you it gives you something to it's a tool. It's something to help you be more accurate because there is no there is no perfect way to guarantee it. The human body is is this crazy adaptive thing. We are not like purely machines. And people try to think of it as that, but there's so much more fluidity in in things like adaptive rate, how people handle fatigue, how people handle certain types of volume. Are you highly reactive or responsive? Uh, those are two factors that are huge in terms of how much training will affect you and affect your recovery and challenge you. Uh, what's your conditioning like? Was that an RPE ten because you're it was a set of a set of nine and you're so out of shape, hello boys, <laughs> that you uh, that you could keep repping it all day in terms of muscular highs, but we just crossed over energy systems being used, and so now you're dealing with lactic acid tolerance and your ability to continue getting adequate air so you can brace properly, or is your stomach starting to shake because you're just you're tanked but you're not you're not at the same kind of uh, muscular level of fatigue that we yeah. were trying to get you to. Yeah. So there, yeah. it's more nuanced. And then you got to look at your personal life, your work, everything else, like all that other stuff. Like you're just factoring in day to day gym if you do nothing else. Yeah. Like you start working, you got a career. You got changes so much, that yeah. week. There's so many different things that'll factor week by week. Yeah. How do you feel about um, using partials? What kind of partial movements do you like to use? Because some people. Some people are dead set against it, and they think it, it messes up, you know, you, like for instance, benching um, in terms of blocks, etc. Some people think it messes up the plane of motion, don't like it. Same with squats, uh, it's got to be full depth or not, maybe pause, but no partials of squats or pulling from blocks. Like, how do you feel about using those kind of things? I, I'm, a, I'm a Star Wars fan, and I think a Sith only deals in absolutes. Whoa. So the idea, of, <laughs> the idea of saying it's all or nothing, you have to do it this way or that way, is in my, in my experience, I guess in my opinion, any time that you take a hard stance of saying this is the only way it can be and there's no other way, this is my system, every lifter has to fit it, that to me is the sign of someone who's going to get stuck eventually because different kinds of things are necessary for different people. Uh, I think that ideally you want to, the three lifts are skills. Powerlifting is a skill sport. You are training the skills of the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift. And it's, it is highly specific in that regard. So you want to get better at those skills. Anything you're doing needs to have the end result of improving your ability to perform those lifts. Mm -hmm. There are some people who will benefit from reducing the range of motion. If I'm trying to teach you how to sumo deadlift and you do not have the hip mobility or the glute mobility to get into an adequate starting position from the ground, it doesn't do me a whole lot of good to say, well, just figure it out and put someone in a compromised starting position and tell them that they're going to be lifting from there. We might have to start you from blocks while we work on developing your hip mobility because even if you're mobile enough to get down there, mm -hmm. but you're having to relax certain parts of the system, because you don't, you lack the adequate mobility to to achieve that starting position. So maybe you're under slack. You see this all the time with squats too. When someone will get down to the bottom and they have that butt wink yep. because their glutes are too tight, and because they they think, oh, I can hit depth, no problem. Yeah, but you you had to relax to get there. So we just took your entire spine under load, went to the toughest part of the lift where the energy transfer is going to happen. You just deloaded and decompressed your entire spine, and now in this. Suboptimal position, you're going to turn everything back on 100% and, and hope that it's better when you couldn't even get to there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so then you see usually the knees will kick in because those adductors haven't been turned on. And so like, oh, I hit depth all the time. Yeah, but you're wiggling your, your booty out of the hole. <laughs> yeah. it's, you're going from zero. You're, you're getting down there with some tension. You're going from 100 to zero, then back to 100. Knees cave in, hips shoot out, person's 
doing a somersault with a bar on their back yeah, yeah. or with the deadlift if you get down there and you're not and you're having to tuck your buns underneath the, to get down to be able to grab the bar it doesn't make sense for me to have someone lifting you know starting them learn to walk before you run learn to crawl before you do that you know yeah. you have to you have to sometimes progress people with those things but it depends heavily on the lifter and what their capabilities are and where they're coming from how do you feel about um, not even just from a mechanical stance, which for sure, a mechanical stance, it's good to have partials, but even from um, training stance for nervous system wise, pulling from blocks so it's a little more, a little more weight, or it's or squatting or benching, a little shortening the range of motion so it's a little more weight. The nervous system gets revved, used to a little more weight in the hands or on the back. Like, how do you feel about incorporating those? Uh, there's. Again, it depends on the lifter and what they need and the season or the, the period of the training. What's the purpose of what we're doing? I, that's how I try to approach all my training. That's how I try to approach my lifter's training. It's why am I doing what I'm doing? What's the purpose? The, the why determines the how. The why of what the goal is for this, for this rep, of this exercise, of this set, of this session in this training block, this macro, in this micro cycle of this macro cycle, it's you, you break it down and say, what is the, what is the intention? What is the goal? And that will determine the way that I perform this. And so I'll sometimes on stream, I'll have guys like, how do you do a bent row? Do you need to be a, a, a perpendicular or parallel with the floor? Or do you need to, you know, it's 45 degrees. Okay. What's my torso angle need to be for this? And so what's the goal? What are you trying to accomplish with it? Why is it in your program? Well, it's just, it just says to do rows. Well, why are you doing the rows? Are you, are you doing it to work on your ability to keep a neutral spine when you deadlift so that you're, you're building up, it's more, it's almost more about an isometric hold and now I'm going to, this is all stabilized and I'm going to be moving this, these extremities with the range of motion, but keeping that all locked in, or is it just about, uh, kind of like Kayla Woolen was talking about in the, the super training video, I like to do heavy cheat rows because the goal is to tax my back as much as possible to help me build my deadlift. Mm -hmm. Those are, I don't think either of those is the wrong answer. It's about the context of why you're doing it and that is how you should go about incorporating those things. I don't, I don't, I, I've been wrong enough times in my life, in my lifting career that I won't just think of something as being totally off the table in terms of potential useful application mm -hmm. it, just because it's not something that I personally understand 100% right now. I, if I, I aspire to become a more well-rounded coach who's open to at least hearing those ideas out and, and considering them, I, I always challenge my lifters. I say, if you have any questions about the about what I have in your program, if it doesn't make sense to you or it, or it makes perfect sense to you. I want you to ask questions and challenge me. If I can't give you a definitive reason that this is in your program, I don't want it in your program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Um, so do you do partials yourself? And if so, when do you put them in your program and why? So Eric and Hanny have me doing some, some pin presses right now for the bench press as well as t-shirt presses, which, uh, What's maybe is a little press? confusing, but the idea, a, a t-shirt press is where you're, I, I have had a bad history, largely due to the shoulder and largely due to some potential laziness when I have long sessions and get into the bench press, mm -hmm. where I sometimes default to kind of becoming a heave bencher, mm -hmm. which is, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. You see some people who are very successful with that style of a bench, but for someone with a bum shoulder like I have, it turns my my high percentage presses into it's just it's another variable they're less consistent when i'm heaving and so a t-shirt press would be benching and stopping at the t-shirt touching your t-shirt but not letting it touch your chest so it's it, it's more than an idea of just a super controlled soft touch where you're you're almost hovering maybe like a photo press but where you're just you're touching the shirt but there's no weight on the chest there's no resting See, Brandon, this at is kind of like for you man you he's got a bum shoulder and he likes to sit it in and heave. Yeah, I fly with it. I like burying, yeah. burying it in the chest. And just get oh, yeah. that hip pump and heaving that back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, no we kidding. lazy boys now. The problem, if you get to a USAPL or an IPF meet and that happens, you open yourself up to the risk of, of one, getting a longer press call yeah. or potentially getting called for, for heaving or a double bounce. If they say press 
and you haven't gotten all that slack yeah. out of the system, if it comes down at all, bar movement down, that's flipped over. Yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, so we're, we're IPF in CPU, they're crazy strict, man. If you ever lifted oh, in yeah. Canada, it is, it's silly. We, like, our, our pauses on bench is like, people put hashtag CPU bench pause, because of all, it's, it's crazy strict, yeah. Yeah. These it's a variables. it's a joke on some of the streams. I've got a few I've got quite a few Canadians who come and visit, and uh, I'm not going to say a particular name because he would want me to. He always he always tries to pimp out his Instagram whenever we're on stream. So a certain individual, if you're watching this, and I know you are, you know who you are. I'm not saying your name, so no one's going to come look <laughs> at your Instagram and chill. Oh, yeah, he, uh, he always gives me a he always gives, he's a self proclaimed chill. He always. Uh, Tells me that my press is, you know, that's, ah, that's a decent for an American pause, but Whoa. that's not an Asian pause. <laughs> well, they yeah. have, um, I believe, the uh, yeah, the APF Worlds next is going to be in Canada, right? But it's international. Yeah, good luck, everybody. What's that? The judges are supposed to. It's supposed to be represented yeah. through different nations and stuff. But yeah, good luck, boys. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be strict, man. That's for sure. So, are you going to be at the next U.S. Raw Nationals? Is that your big next meet? Yes, sir. That's the plan. Uh, down in Orlando. With uh, with Gear with Gear Bear and Baby Boy Bryce and all the fun guys. So and um, so ninety three kilo, correct? Uh, one hundred and five. I'm oh, gonna be hanging out with the boys. Oh shit! Yep, going up. So how long? We were. Is this new? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, newish. I I did the Arnold as a one hundred and five, but I was like ninety nine kilos. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Last year at Nationals, I don't, I don't think I would have a problem making the cut. We struggled a little bit with the water cut, uh, just with the timing. And so I ended up having to spit out the last half kilo, 45 minutes into the, into the prime time weigh-in. So I only got an hour to recomp out of the two-hour weigh-in. That sucks. Um, but, and I shouldn't have had any problem. We were actually were trying to play it a little bit closer because the meet before, I accidentally dropped down all the way to 199. So it was, oh, it's shit. not a matter of being able to make the cut. It's just a matter happen? of... How did you accidentally drop six more pounds? That's crazy. I, I know, right? I was just, <laughs> I was, my macros didn't change for six months. My macros were the same. I was losing a consistent amount of weight, but I'm a, I'm kind of a night owl. So I tend to eat pretty late at night. And so a week out, I said, I'm going to start finishing my meals, you know, 30 minutes earlier and finishing my water 30 minutes earlier each time. And so I just walked those down, started at like, I'm going to finish by 10 p.m. I'm going to finish by 9 p.m. I'm going to finish. So the night before the meet, I was like, you know, I was, I was pretty close to being on weight, 207 maybe. And I cut all of my food and water around 730 just to make sure. And I woke up and weighed myself. And I'm like, all right, I'm on weight. I, you know, I'll have a little sip of water and eat a eat like a protein brownie or something and go in and I step on the scale there and it's 199. I said, excuse me, sir. Holy smokes, say? man. So we tried to play it a little closer than for uh, Raw Nationals, but being in the prime time, it, we weighed in so much. I, I'd never have to weigh in at like three in the afternoon before. So yeah. trying to manage how my body kind of did, you know, when do I cut off my food and water to make sure that I'm on weight when that happens? Because it wasn't a big cut. We weren't cutting a lot. It's just my body was like, oh, no, you're, you're good right here. But yeah. six, that's where you want to be, right? Yeah, we're not moving. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And just in general, my body tends to be a little bit more injury resistant when I'm above 212. And so, I mean, ideally, it'd be nice if they brought back the 220 class. I'd love that. That's <laughs> don't, don't, I, I, no class. Yeah, because you used to be in those old classes back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, back in all those other federations, I was a 198 for years and years, and then moved up to 220. As a, I was never weighted more than 220 when that was happening, but just you know, you you have to you lift where you lift, and you have to listen to the, whatever they have going on. So, so when you do your water cuts, what do you do to want to cut the water? Anything? I'm not that? great at them. I'm. It it usually just comes into you load your you load your water and your sodium earlier in the week, you know, progressively more, and then before when at a certain at a specified time depending on the person or the system that you're yeah. using you cut your water and you cut your sodium your body continues to flush it all out uh, you dehydrate yourself and then you try to make sure that you get it back in it's i'm not a huge fan of doing it i'd rather people just weigh what they weigh 
but any any kind of high level of sport you're going to run into you know you're going to try and get the most out of what you can be as competitive as possible and then you get like the 24 hour weigh in guys who are doing those crazy. ridiculous cuts and having to get IVs afterwards yeah, yeah. well here's the thing too like um, so for some people it's easy for some people to say you know I don't I don't want to cut I don't believe in it yeah, but you just probably happen to weigh 205 or 206 all the time. Right. But right. if a guy is like, I mean, these weight classes are huge. Some of them are 22 pound gap. So if you're at the very bottom, let's say you're, you're, you weigh in at 182, you walk around at 188, yes, you're going to cut six pounds of water. Because if you walk in there and go against a guy who's 215, you're getting pumped. You know what I mean? Unless you're a phenomenal athlete, you're probably going to get pumped. So... It, the weight class is just so flipping big, and um, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't mind myself if the weight classes were instead of twenty two pounds, stuffed in a couple extra weight classes in there, and just kind of. But it is what it is. That might stop water cut. You might get a little diluted. I do have the talent pool. I mean, there's other. It, it opens up a whole other thing, right? Uh, it might stop water cutting, where it might encourage people to drop four classes instead of one. You know, you <laughs> never, true, we'll try to be like, as competitive as possible. That's I true. think just at the at the old, at the at the highest level of anything, you're gonna you're gonna have people. Why why is it that in powerlifting, most in raw meets, you can only wear like tidy whities and you can't wear compression like you know boxer briefs? People always complain about that, and it's well because. Some guy tried to find a way to game the system and got the tightest boxer briefs ever. And he's like, these are like wearing briefs for me. No so, shit. Yeah, that's true. It's just in any in any situation where there's where there's you can potentially get a competitive advantage, there are gonna be some guys who that's where they're gonna go. Look at the technology of knee sleeves in the last, I don't know, five years when S B D came out, when before we had those Ray Bands, which are not the same level. And yeah. if, if people come up and say, My knee my knee sleeves so don't give me anything on my squat, well then you're using them wrong, kid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's just silly. Yeah, for sure. And when you weighed in that one day, one ninety nine, did that greatly affect your lifts? Was it a shit day or did you do okay anyways? Uh, I had a little goofus time myself there. My first squat, they called me on deck and uh, as I was loading up my first warm up because we got the flights mixed up. So that was oh, the biggest problem. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, it's, yeah, it wasn't a great day. Um, but I, I'm not, so I didn't feel super off because of the weight. I just kind of was off in execution anyway. So, so but then. Coming in as 105, or what's your body weight at right now? Not enough. <laughs> yeah, because those boys are huge. Still a little boy. I'm taking it as a I'm taking it as a two year approach, and I, I I will probably weight close to the weight class by the time we get there. But I'm not going to feel like I've really filled it out until probably nationals next year. But I've been like I said, I've been doing this a long time. I'm I, I'm I'm pretty good at being patient. And understanding that it takes a long time. I have said a bunch of times that I was never accused of being genetically gifted until I've been lifting for almost 10 years. So I, I'm no stranger to, I don't think there's anything particularly special about, about my process. It's just a matter of being stubborn enough and, and still, you know, continuing to do it for long enough until it works the way I want it to. I like how you just said that, how. Nobody ever accused me of being genetically gifted until 10 years of working on my craft. And that not that like, it's true where some people literally watch and think, I got to get there within two years. I got to do what this guy's doing in a couple of years or else. And they don't realize this dude's been doing this for 10 years. He's a 10 year yeah. vet. You know, it's not like I, it's hard work, consistency over time. I, I tend to think I represent the, the normal guy who found something that he loved doing enough that he made the choice to do it regardless of, of genetic I don't think I have bad genetics but I don't think mine are exceptional I don't think that I'm that I'm there's some I, I wasn't a, fen, a phenom at any point I was never that guy is gonna be the next step and comer and I've done I've done pretty well for myself in the sport you break national records in the open especially US national records that's pretty, that's pretty good <laughs> it's just a, it's just been a matter of 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 a stubborn effort over a long period of time and acceptance of, of doing what you can. So I think the one the one area where I have 
maybe my my advantage comes in the the mental side of things with the the work ethic that comes to what I bring to my craft and the and the way to be self the, my the ability to to separate myself from I guess being too close to be able to give myself fair feedback and criticism. I'm I'm very adept at, at self critique and and working on things to improve. Uh, the better I've gotten at this, the more success I've found in my sport, the less impressed with myself I've become. Hmm. And I guess the, the, the humility has, has kind of come every time you every time you get to where you think the top of the hill is and you yes, i I'm finally there, I finally have it figured out, and you look and you see that there's just a bigger continuation <laughs> of that hill. And the the more I learn, the le- the more I realize that I have to learn. So Dude, it's it's crazy. The more people we have on this and we have like I mean we've had all types of world champions and yada yada and I swear to God, everybody's got a different approach. Everybody it's literally the more you know, the less you know, or it's like shit man, like what rep ranges do you use? I don't go anything over four reps. Or I train four days a week. Or you shouldn't take too many days off. You gotta be in there six days a week. And it's just all, and these guys are all killing it. Guys and girls are all killing it. And coaches the whole night. It's like, you can't. There's so many different approaches that is kind of like you said, where just when you think, okay, I got it. I got it figured out. You're gonna read something next week that's gonna blow your mind. And you're gonna be like, ah! I tried it and it works. Shit, that changes everything. So it is. You got to be adaptive in terms of yeah, the sport, and you, for sure. You have to be open to to changing your your mind when something is is shown to you that deserves your attention and your respect. I mm-hmm. think that there's a lot of people who uh, will become kind of dogmatic in their approach and say, "No, no, no. This is the way. I know this is the only way that works." Yeah. Where. The scientific method is the idea that when you're presented with evidence that challenges and overrules your current understanding of the situation, if you are a real scientist, then you, all right, I, I 100%, I it changed. That's not, that's not being inconsistent. That's not being a flip flopper. You're not a politician. You're trying to learn. You're, you're, you need to be willing to shift your understanding. There's things that I thought were the absolute truth, best way to do something years ago, that right now, if, if someone came and said, well, in this video, you said, and that's the voice they always have, I know it. In this video, you said this is the thing to do. And I said, yeah, I, my understanding has changed. And maybe at that time, that's what it, that was the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. But it's... What, do you got an example of one off the top of your head? That you used to do uh, or used to think? Just more being better. More is better with training in regards to frequency or in regards to volume and just you know the the structure of a training block. You see it, you still see it with a lot of young guys who are you know you just have to you just have to sacrifice your body as much as you need to and just go as hard as possible. If you're not dead at the end of every session, then then you're not really giving your best. Mm-hmm. And it's I'm just, what if I what if I want to give my best for this entire week? You know, I'll give my best effort for whatever the plan is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I need to uh, be just completely, you know, RPE eleven where I'm mm-hmm. having technical breakdown in mid rep to to try and get something finished. It's just rep quality, positional awareness. Uh, Attention to your time off outside of the gym is really important. Anybody can be a gym a gym hero, you know, four times a week for a few hours a day. But are you going to be the guy who's going to? I hate cooking. Are you going to be the guy who's going to get over that and try to figure out how to how to eat to fuel your success? Or yeah. you know, are you willing to do some mobility if you need to? I think that I I do enough mobility on my off days or even on my training days. Or somebody said that seems excessive. And I say, yeah, I agree. I wish I didn't have to do it. So how much, be mobility, nice. how, how much mobility do you do in terms of how, how much I, time a day? I mean, safe bet, every day no matter what, probably 45 minutes of, of intentional mobility work. And if I'm distracted, the ADHD kicks in. It might turn into two hours, and it won't be as effective as that 45 minutes. No but shit. It's, yeah, and it's, I don't think everyone needs that. I think yeah. that... I think that for me, though, the way that I train and how long I've been doing this and how not 
exceptional I am when it comes to like recovery and my genetic capacity to hold and and work through fatigue. It sometimes it takes me a little bit more than it would for someone else. And that doesn't mean that I should sit here and stamp my feet and pout about it. Someone else may have an easier time with that particular aspect of it because I might have an easier time with something else. I didn't have to struggle through school. I was able to get through that, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have different gifts and different challenges. And I guess my, my approach through all of it is to decide what the biggest goals that I have are in terms of my own personal growth, to put my best effort into those, and then to be honest in my assessment afterwards of if – if I approached it in the correct way, because if I, the one thing I can usually guarantee is the effort's going to be there. Mm-hmm. So then that opens me up to being able to, to question the process and to be reflective about the choices that I made or the choices that we make, you know, kind of through the coaching experience and say like, I, you know, I tried my best with this. We had a couple of things not go the way we wanted to. Where do we adjust? You know, the easiest thing to fix is usually for lifters the the effort with those other things, and there is always something to fix. You could always be doing something better. Which you you mentioned your goals. What are some of your goals you got coming up? It, I I've actually kind of killed the the personal idea of having numbers that I chase. Really? Why is that? Did you get emotionally attached to them, and it became? It no, it just doesn't. It, it's not going to help me reach those numbers. I guess the way that I the way that I think about motivation, and it's different. I know that some some guys in the in the field feel differently than I do. I've I've put a lot of time in the last few years into working on uh, kind of awareness, mindfulness. I I meditate daily to try and to try and bring up my psychological proclivity to be able to perform. And one thing that I've really tried to attach myself to is the approach of, again, that best effort, best self. If you, I can't affect what has happened, you know, acceptance of, of, of my ability to impact my will or my force on, on the world is whatever I can do right now is the only thing I have any control of. And so putting something out here that I'm thinking out, like it's nice to know the direction. I know the direction is that I'm working towards giving my best performance. My best chance of doing that is going to be taking this current repetition with 100% focus. Mm -hmm. So opening myself up to the idea of this next set or this next, or this next, again, kind of that breaking down all the way to the, to the present moment from, you know, this training cycle, this session, this set, this rep, best rep possible right now. I'm going to give my best effort to do this to the best of my ability and have no attachment to the capability because I can't control whether or not I'm capable of doing it right now. Mm-hmm. I, that's that's in the past. All I can control is my focus on this present moment and anchor myself to that and then I do my best and I can either do it or I can't do it. If I can do it, awesome on to the next thing. If I can't do it, I just tried my best to doing it, so there's no reason to, you know, it's learn what I can from the failure, reassess, but the effort was consistent. I gave my best my best try at that. And so to dwell on it or to or to have it negative negatively affect me isn't as constructive or productive. And so taking every single one of your reps with that kind of a mental approach, which can be exhausting but I have found that to be the best chance for me to perform at my highest level on any particular day. I'll let Eric and Hanny worry about the numbers. I don't call my own numbers at meets when they're there. That, that was my follow-up question is, uh, see, because that sometimes when you walk into a meet, it's you. sometimes you can just lay in bed thinking about the fucking numbers, analyzing it, being like, well, if I open with this, then I go this, then I go there. And, like, you kind of, you know, you have these numbers, and if you – miss one or the war up you got to lower it it can rattle you if, if you've been thinking about it too damn long for months about where you want to end up whereas maybe the approach like you're saying is look at let my handlers they know the numbers i've been hitting they know what i should be going for and you just do your best on whatever they load on the bar right it, it sounds like yeah. you're focusing on the pro on the process not so much the outcome and wait and seeing what the outcome will be like by letting the handlers choose that Yes, process, process, and approach-oriented goals, not outcome-based goals. That's uh, 100% from the sports psychological background. That's 
Is that's that your how you continue. Sorry, is that your background? I, no, I'm a, I studied vocal performance music in college. I was a weirdo, I told you. But I, uh, <laughs> I, study, I study things like social psychology and sports psychology on my own. It's, it's oh, a no, passion sure. of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and so I and don't have they say, any... They say just focus on the process? A lot of the time, they're just, I, you know, in any in any field, there are going to be people who have different approaches. Yeah. I'm very much not tied to things like uh, like improving your motivation as much. I'm more in in just the idea of, of taking the process and, and it being uh, commitment to choices and commitment to choices and letting go of any kind of attachment that you need. It's almost kind of stoic stoicism. Of just letting go of the attachment that you might have to any of these things, because you, your con- ability to control so many various uh, factors is going to keep you up at night and stress about those. Where the only thing that I have any kind of ability to to be an agent of is is the effort that I'm doing right now in this moment. It can't think past the moment. And so when it comes to when it comes to doing the meets, my my the way that I feel about the meat is is going to be tied purely to is going to be purely tied to the process of I'm trying to do my best right now and if I am not capable of doing whatever the thing is trying harder wouldn't have changed that outcome so I just was not my my expectations and my reality hadn't lined up accurately mm-hmm. and. And so I can't change reality. I can only change my expectations and, and try to get them closer to being in line with that. Hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the way that I like to go about it. Well, a lot of the good coaches over the years, like whether it's boxing, they don't train to beat the champ. They train to beat the next fighter. If so, right. it's those things. It's the process, right? The, the overall goal is to be the champion, but they have to train for each fighter. Football, you know, they look at uh, – plays from the other team that they're going to play and they'll look at per player, not per team, right? How they break down right. the players and it's the process, not the outcome. <laughs> right. And, and sometimes, especially I, this, maybe this analogy is, is potentially helpful to try and, and think about why I think this is an important way to go about it. No one ever plans their next injury into their training cycle. <laughs> no one ever plans the the intangibles, the things that are coming up that are going to totally throw you off. Someone, a death in the family, your girlfriend breaks up with you, your your you know your your dog runs away. Like there are so many things that can affect every aspect of it. And so when I see, especially with younger guys, who are convinced that they are going to be able to reach all of these goals, and it's so tied to this number, I need to hit this for this, mm-hmm. whatever. You. If, if, if you were walking down the street and you're going towards this big mountaintop that you're trying to, that's where you're trying to reach and you're so focused looking up here, you're not paying attention to where you're walking. You might fall into this pit of fatigue or setback and what are you going to do when you, when you trip and fall? Because you're not paying enough attention to the present moment. You're not paying attention to what you're doing. It, you know, maybe let's look straight ahead so you can see that it's there. But I'm also going to avoid the punji pit that some douchebag put up next door. <laughs> yeah, well said, well said. And that might be why you give your clients weekly uh, programs, so they're just focusing on what they got right there, as opposed to give the whole block a month ahead and they're looking at the third, no. fourth week. And sometimes, what do I got? What do we got coming up next week, Coach? We got another week of training. Get the, get through this one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so easy though. It's so easy. Good. Make it easy. Make it look easy. Convince me that I need to give you more. Be so perfect that I am forced to to increase the rate of progression. Because if you're struggle busting through this, it doesn't matter what we have planned next. I'm going to change it. Yeah. Because because we the program needs to adapt to you, and the process needs to adapt to you. And it doesn't matter what we have planned if something happens that means we have to adapt to the plan and and change it because if whatever your goals are if you go to the meet and you don't have that number on the day we can't will you to that Mm -hmm. we can't we can't suddenly make you capable if you are incapable of doing that so disassociate yourself with that particular number do the best that you can on the day that's going to get you the closest to that number that you would have if you would have shot too far and you miss it then you miss it Mm -hmm. it's 
it's just one of those things where it really does come down to like being mindful of the present moment, working on acceptance that there are things you can and can't control, and the things that you can't control, you can note that they're there, but you, you can't hang on to them too tightly, and then use those two aspects to make conscious commitment-based choices towards the person that you're trying to be, whether it's a power lifter, whether it's a musician, whether it's uh, through your education with schooling or uh, any other career field, it's, you, you can't, it doesn't do a whole, it's not productive mm -hmm. to get so caught up on what I, on your uh, potential instead mm -hmm. of focusing on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you see this a lot where, you know, oh, I, I did this, you know, that the Don Mazzetti from, from the, from the bro, Bro science. Oh my gosh. Bro, yeah, science. Yeah, bro yeah. science, bro yeah. science, bro science. When he does the 225 bench press in one of the earliest episodes, 225 bench press, and the guy pretty much pulls it off of him, and he's like, "Oh, you man, oh you, <laughs> yeah, oh me, 405 next, good three. It's like that's how some of these younger guys think about stuff. Of oh man, I just hit my first 600 pound, whatever. 700s next on my list. Yeah. Right, maybe 601s on your list, but yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. maybe what's your what's your next What's the next thing you can do? Because if you're jumping that, if you're if you're jumping to the next conclusion, I, I'm not saying you can't do it. But what if you have more than that in you, but you're so focused on this number that you're not you're not committing to, to being present and aware of the of the current moment. The, the next one's an L5 disc hernia. That's right. Sometimes, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Face yourself. Face yourself. Yeah, what, you, what? What, uh, going to this U.S. Nationals, so um, is this, this your first U.S. Nationals at 105 then? Yeah, I was 93 last year. This would be my first at 105. So do you ever make any kind of goals in terms of, um, if not numbers-wise, because you've broken records, like do you ever say, like, I'm going for this record? Or is it just, ha to even that happens organically? Oh, shit. So you're, ta you, you're, you're saying, you're talking about the, I don't think that record, to me that record didn't really matter because, uh, I mean, Jesse Norris exists, and so <laughs> I, I think his records got expunged when he when he got popped for the stimulant. Mm -hmm. um, so that was whatever. The the one some of the bigger records that I actually was intentional of earlier in my career, I had a world record for WABDL, which at the time was a bigger deal because USAPL and IPF weren't as competitive. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for I for a, for a short while. I had the 220 time, uh, 220, 220 all time across all federations uh, drug tested knee wrap total record and squat. When I squatted 705 with knee wraps and totaled like 1835 at 209. Oh, shit. And so, so were you I, purposely going for those bad boys or did it just happen? I didn't know they were records. The 705 was a misload. I called for 700. They loaded 705. What the shit? And then the the total i was just excited to hit the numbers that i hit on the day and i found out afterwards that on powerlifting watch that was across all federations that was the highest drug tested total in in everything at the time and again i if i would have known that it might have changed the way that i approached it but i don't think it would have helped me do better on the day yeah yeah and it makes so, better you did it you know it just happens naturally yeah, I was just lifting. I was just trying my best. And so, you know, if you're if you're not capable of doing a record, chasing a record's kind of pointless. That's true. Too. So <laughs> if you're if you're just trying to give your best performance on the day, take the most weight that's there, and then pay attention too to so what's you know what your goal is for the meet. Is my goal to try and chase a record? Is my goal to have a PR total? Is my goal for placement? Because there's a lot of guys. If you look at worlds this last year, everyone was hyping up the 105 battle. Yeah. And I am personally invested in many of those lifters. I had a lot of guys on stream. Who do you? Okay, Ben, you're you love Bryce and you love Garrett. Who do you want to win? And I would always say I want everybody to have their absolute best day, and whoever's best day is the best day. I want them to win. But when you look at it, no one had their best day. It just came down to because there were so many other factors. Uh, when someone's prepping and getting all ready to go to one of these big meets. When you're used to having your own space or whatever gym you train at, where you're timing out your own rest periods, uh, I've had I've had quite a few situations where the warm-ups got rushed or the time in between attempts got rushed. At my last meet, 
we had two guys get hurt and two guys were bench only guys. And so going into the deadlifts, my attempt timing got thrown off because all of a sudden I got bumped up four people in the rotation Mm -hmm. to do my next attempt. So I was taking really short rests in between my first, second, and third attempts on my deadlift. And it's, if that's not something you've prepared yourself for, it's definitely not something you can predict. It's definitely not something that you can uh, that you can be ready for. It's just something that you have to adapt to in the moment. And so if you're only focused on hitting this certain number, but they just knocked off five minutes of your planned recovery time in between your second and third attempt for your deadlift, is it is it reasonable to expect that you're able to, to do that thing where you would have needed to have all the factors mm-hmm. going your way in order to perform that? Or are you going to take the lift that is, probably the more, uh, not not the safer bet, but the one that's going to give you the highest chance of success in a highly competitive situation. And I think that's, that's something that people forget a lot. You imagine yourself having all of your best lifts on the same day. There's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot that can go wrong. And it, and it really does come down to approaching, approaching your goals on the day as a standalone thing instead of trying to project like, well, this is, you know, your training can give you an idea and suggestion of what you think you should be capable on the day. But again, those expectations and reality, if they're off because the reality is different than you thought it was going to be, mm-hmm. what has to change? All well, your expectations. What did you think about that battle of the 105s? Was that not crazy? I was actually the... Oh, I, I, was, I loved it. Yeah, I was the commentator uh, for that one. And being there live, man, it was like the tension was crazy. And screaming, oh, yeah. and like it was like the, the whole place was like there were soccer chants going from the fans, and like it was nuts, man. It was it was um, the two of the two world championships I did commentating for Battle of the 105s of 2017 and the 83 kilo showdown between Gibbs Hack were like and obviously Ray Williams, but those were the big ones for me for sure. Right. Well, the idea when someone else can potentially win. It's, you know, with Ray, it's like, who, how much is Ray going to do with those yeah. other ones? It's, it's, it, attempt selection matters more for placement. Someone mm-hmm. may have, you know, may go for a lift that's, that's not their ceiling. With it. I had, one of my lifters won the junior, the junior worlds, Mark McQueen, uh, 120 junior champion. And oh, I've okay. worked with him for over two years. And we went in with a game plan internationally where I was messaging him, you know, the ideas and stuff and, and communicating through him with his, with his platform, you know, game day coach from Great Britain. And I'm friends with Jackson. And Dude, so I, was going and to say, Jackson, he, I actually called that. I was commentating that one too. And, yeah, um, and I, listened, Jackson's, I watched it. I listened to it and everyone's talking about Jackson getting that number. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know Jackson. I know Mark. I know what Mark can pull. I have a pretty good idea of what Jackson can pull. Yeah. I think this. I think this call's the right call. Yeah. And it was. It was a uh, like. It was tough because I'm Canadian. Jackson's Canadian, and you're the yeah. commentator. So like, ah, I try not to be biased here. Let's hope yeah. something. Up. But yeah, I mean that's a hell of a battle itself. Yeah. But then the 105s. I had a meet the same day. My last. My last meet. And so I was. That was going on while I was driving to the meet. I was stuck in traffic for an extra hour and a half and was listening to it on my phone. Well, it was, Dude, it was, it was crazy. crazy. I'm, I was glad that Garrett, even though he didn't have the day he wanted because he got sick, I was I was glad he was able to get his uh, the squat and the bench because I think he was able to kind of hang on that long. Mm-hmm. With those, because um, he, I know his his expectations got really beat up from being sick in Belarus. I was really proud of Bryce for, I think a lot of people had kind of written him off with, when you see the kind of the hype around those other guys and Bryce's qualifying total was, the nomination total was lower because he had set his record and hadn't competed since uh, Raw Nationals when he mm-hmm. got that qualifier spot. And so then when Garrett... You know, I was there at Nationals. I was I was filming for Garrett and Bryce, uh, hanging out with Garrett's wife and, and daughter the whole time, and it's trying to cheer for both guys. It, I think the easiest the easiest way to be a fan in that and to not be torn is just to hope that everybody does their best. Yeah. So. And, then, and then you throw in the mix um, Christoph from Poland, who was just an absolute cyborg, who could just, yeah. like, 
Lo he, he gets the advantage of just loading on the bar whenever he has to for his last deadlift to chip in the win. Right. And then you got um, Screamer, who is like as colorful a character as you're going to find in any sport. And um, just like a beast out there, super energetic. It was really good. That was, they definitely stole the show, the Mile 105. Did you have a chance oh, yeah. to watch it afterwards? I, I was, li like I said, I was listening to it on my way and I was, uh, I have a little, I have a little, little phone mount in the car and I would, <laughs> what's happening here, what's happening here, okay. Every now and then you and hear, hey, what was that, what happened, what happened, what was that, you yeah, like, yeah. 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 No, so shit. I, I watched, I watched, I watched my boys do their lifty things and I was, I was real proud. I was real yeah, proud Bryce of was actually, it was, the thing that made Bryce kind of like hang in there and make a fight of it with, with Christoph from Poland was that um, he was he was so consistent. Just right through, he wasn't like, like you kind of mentioned, he wasn't overshooting, he wasn't missing, he was he was hanging in there, he didn't need to be the best squatter, but he's up there, didn't need to be the best at any of the three lifts, like in terms of the number one guy, but he had to yeah. just be there in terms of like the top three, so by the time you add it all up, his consistency and, and, and being like, and hanging tough made his total just, I mean, he, he, he at least made Christoph load some weight on the bar and have to pull that. Yeah, and I think I think that's, I mean that's something that the Garys, the the coaches for the American team, really pride themselves on is is attempt selection, taking what's there on the day, trying to put up the most competitive total. The idea of of you know nine for nine is what you want. Eight for nine is uh, sometimes happens. Seven for nine. All right, what's what's going on here? Six, Six for nine, nine is pretty unacceptable. Team. <laughs> it's well, it's, it's one of those things of how many how many lifts did you leave? I don't care about how much weight you left on the platform. How many attempts did you leave up there? Mm -hmm. You know, how could you have, could you have improved your total by by taking smaller jumps on some thirds instead of missing those? And I again, I think that 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 meet specifically had such a tight uh, time frame that they were running in, where everybody was just moving so quick. Where on the day you need to you need to put up what you can given the circumstances, and the circumstances are by the time you finish your your last squat, you may be warming up for bench. And so power lift, there's a difference between being the strongest guy in the room and being the best power lifter in the room, mm -hmm. because power lifting in a competitive sense becomes a sport. And so that's again why I let Eric and Hanny call my numbers because I don't want to have to worry about the game. I just want to. I, you know, if they put it on the bar, I trust that they trust me to be able to lift it, and I'm going to do my best to execute and let them worry about the stress that comes with playing that game. Yeah, and it's, it's, if, they, if they know you, too, the thing is, too, like, you may feel the lift, it may feel, but they may see something you don't, too, standing to the side. That's a big difference, and, too. Like, and also, they're, they're let them crunch numbers if you're fighting for uh, whatever placings or, I mean, if, if you watch the world, you see, or at Nationals or whatever, you see guys changing their last deadlift attempt and then changing it again and right. have an opener, but they lowered their opener and different shit's going on for different yeah. reasons. And if you're lifting, you don't need to be crunching numbers. You don't need to be, why did he do this? Why did he do that? Your coaches can handle that end of things. You just lift what's on the box. You know, it makes right. things a lot so, easier. Yeah, and it's, I mean, if someone's just purely out of class, I, I always say it, Jesse Norris exists. If Jesse Norris shows up, you know, your best shot is to is to put up your best day and hope that he has a horrible day worse than he's ever had. But I would never wish that on him. But the idea is like some guys, some guys are just I wish that on a couple of guys. Just, but anyway, <laughs> well, just it's just where there's just a class that there's no you know your best day and his worst unless he bombs out like you're not going to do anything. So don't don't worry so much about him. Just focus on what you're able to put up. Again, it always comes back down to what can I do. And, and giving your attention to the present moment and just performance and, and once you have a plan commit fully to that plan if you need to change the plan later you know that's that's just the nature of what we do what do you think is going to happen with Jesse Norris is this guy ever going to go to the world championships for the open and represent US and snag a world title because this guy is like the uncrowned champ who oh, yeah. you it's, know what I mean it's kind of weird he, even when he's hurt even when he's hurt I think he's still capable I just 
You just want to see I'm, you want to see him at the IPF World Championships. You know? Yeah. Well, he's he's done it as an equip lifter when he was younger. A long time ago, though. Like as a junior equip lifter, like that's. I yeah. mean, we want to see him right now. This is Jesse. Oh, Wilson. I I do too. He's putting his spine back together currently. He's got all those compressed discs in his lower back. Um, is he I think still he posted about up? it. Yeah, because when they ask him, a lot of people will ask him when you coming back, and he always says the same thing: "When I'm ready." That's so is he it. doing? Is he, he doing he's, raw he's, nationals? He's, I don't know. I don't know if he is or not, but he's always been straight about it. He won't. He won't announce what he's doing or anything because if he's not feeling it, yeah. The one thing about him is, I will say, he won't risk any more injury. Like he's, like, well, I guess he, he pulls is it and he discs still moves now? Big, but he's been he's been hurt for so long. Like it, as soon as one thing recovers, his, he hurts something else. He's always hurt. It was his shoulder. Oh, it was his shoulder last year after yeah. he did a strongman competition because he can. He's, he can do things no one else can do. Yeah. Anyone else is like he did a bodybuilding show on three weeks notice once just because he's walking around lean enough to take to, to place in it. Mm-hmm. And he did a strongman competition. He's like, I just like strongman. I just think I'm just going to do some strong. Bah! He just mm-hmm. wins that. And then, you know, messes up his shoulder, goes, still qualifies, still is able to win at nationals despite getting uh, a squat called high and a deadlift called back for soft lockout. Mm-hmm. And benching less than he's ever benched. I, I followed him on the bench, which is a problem. <laughs> Which is a problem. Not for you. Yeah. For him. He's got he's got God, I told him backstage, I said, You hear that, Jesse? They called they called Jesse Norris on deck, Ben Rice in the hole. That's, you're never gonna hear that. Yeah, that's right. You go, so, Jesse, what's going on, man? Up on your heels. Yeah. 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 But I I think he's the most impressive lifter I've ever seen. Uh I I told him at Nationals that I don't I don't fan. I don't fan girl, and I fan girl for him. And I, I hope he. I hope he recovers and is able to come back and and do his thing. What do you think? What do you think about that Ukrainian kid? He didn't have the best day at the worlds, um, but he he's done an eight forty three total. He's twenty one years old from Ukraine. I don't want to butcher his name. He came in fourth at the world, so he didn't have. He was number one nomination, but he did not have the greatest of days. But if anyone's going to push Jesse, because he's a young kid from Ukraine, mm-hmm. like he's a kid, man, and he is just a beast out there with an eight forty three total at twenty one. He's capable. Mm-hmm. Him with Jesse, if him and Jesse down the road, it could be a back a for real battle. And he's yeah, from Ukraine, I, so he doesn't have the height that Jesse has, though, right? Right. Well, I mean, Jesse just needs to get there, right? Jesse yeah. was. He, he, the nationals, he, the first nationals he won, he didn't go because the stimulant mm-hmm. issue. And the second, I mean, he would have, he would have blown Kristoff out of the water at that meet. And then the next one he won, he was off for recovery time. And that's, that's just, I, you know, I just hope he, I wish him a speedy recovery and all the stuff he's working through. But do you think he would beat Kristoff that easily at 93? Yeah. That it, that particular nationals, yeah. yeah. Well, that for sure because yeah, Christoph that, that, that world. But Christoph was injured, right? He got a bronze, didn't he? I think he had a bronze that one. No, Christoph, Christoph won. He, Christoph has won since yeah. they were in South no, Africa. No, but in, he's won in every year. Texas, he didn't win though. He he was injured, and the forty three year old Ukrainian won it. Buyani or whatever his name is. I bet you the people watching right now. You guys owe me money. All right, maybe they you guys owe me money. Twenty dollars each if you he transfer me. I'm betting, thinking. <laughs> you're I'm betting thinking. right now. I want, my account is sixpacklab at hotman dot com. He transfer me twenty dollars. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse didn't. The meet I'm talking about was the one where Kristoff beat one and Lane took second because that's the oh, that was the national where Lane went okay, because guys. Jesse Jesse couldn't go and so Lane got the qual went to the qualification. Jesse was. Would have destroyed him. Would have yeah, yeah. out. Would have pulled a similar fear. number. Would have benched. Would have benched more and would have squatted a hundred pounds more than Kristoff did. It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been a fight in that in that year. Um, and I don't. I didn't. Honestly, the Texas Worlds. I didn't watch very much of. Oh no shit. Nah, I didn't. I. I think it was uh, the same. I watched Mark. Um. When he was lifting, I watched my I watched my guys, and I think it was the same weekend that there was some uh, a League of Legends tournament. So I was I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to watch my boys from Team Solo Mid. <laughs> no kidding, I got gotcha. you. Okay, so Randy, you got any, there's a question we got actually 
off of it. You want to check on the Instagram. There's a question we got somebody had fired in and wanted us to ask you. If I'm not mistaken, one second here. I'm good with whatever. I'm an open okay. book. I, like I said, I spend multiple hours a week answering questions from randos on the internet. So. So the question we got is, how do you convince a client that it's a long-term success that matters, which is why the short-term blocks can be boring and big meets like raw nats don't mean as much as a sub-junior doing their first national meet? You have to, with any kind of mental approach, you have to factor in the mindset and the psychology of that lifter. It's really hard to do it. Some lifters are need to come to those conclusions on their own. So your job as a coach is to find a way to kind of ninja your way in there and convince them of that. You can't just tell them. Some people are really resistant to you telling them this is the way it is and you just need to listen to me because we've all been young and known everything. Mm -hmm. It's only when you get older that you find out that now you know everything and you were an idiot back then, right? And that's just kind of, we go, our, we go through our life our lives doing that. I think that sometimes it's helpful to show examples of other lifters. I have a couple of lifters who we struggle with that too. And it's just a matter of being patient and giving them. Yeah. I don't think there's any such thing as an uncoachable athlete, but I think there are coaches who it's not worth it to them and shouldn't be worth it to them to work with certain cases because there are some athletes who need so much uh, of that kind of attention and approach where it ends up being bad for business or bad for you as a coach yeah, to, you don't wanna give, like, to cater yeah. to that. It, you, you need to approach each lifter with their own, their own psychological setting and, and, come to some sort of agreement so that they're going to be able to actually listen to you and do what they need to do. In my experience, and, and I guess you can tell them, tell them this, in my experience, the most progress I've made has been the progress that comes from putting in the work that is testing less and training more. If something's really important to you, and maybe maybe pose them this, this question, kind of, kind of phrase it in a way that if, if this is something you're really passionate about, and you want to find your absolute best. If I told you that your your potential ceiling is higher from taking a more long term approach and just avoiding injury for as long as possible, and you will win more down the road by committing to that, then then maybe it's worth kind of humbling yourself to the process and and just making the long-term commitment to trying your absolute best to get to be the best that you potentially could ever be rather than how good can I be in the next training block. I think some of these, I think a lot of that has to do with like the social media too, because social media, you see, you know, people like yourself or like Ryan who started earlier in the game didn't have that. So your progress right. was whatever you gained in the gym, not the guy you saw who just did 200 pounds more than your, your mm -hmm. best lift, right? And he, right. started, he looks like he's the same age, started at the same time as she. So you chase those numbers that are there, and they're just pushing, saying, well, if they can do it, I can do it. But, you know, they don't know. It's like you. You said, you know, nobody called you a freak of nature until until you got 10 years in, right? So that that's the thing. Like, you'd never know what that back, that backstory is on yeah. these people or what they were doing prior to that. But I think those are some of the negatives and positives of social media right now is that, it was great for the sport. It, it made it explode, but at the same time, there's people just chasing numbers at expectations, yeah. and, and especially the newbie gains. You see the newbie gains, and then the next gain is sure as hell is not going to be that. Yeah, like, it could be five. You fight for five pounds yeah. on the bench. Yeah. yeah. And have you been hurt yet? A lot of the younger guys haven't had their first injury, and I don't wish it on anybody. But it's it's one of those. You find out how much you care about something when you go from. From making solid progress towards a goal to you need to figure sure. some stuff out because you because it's all taken away from you for at least some time and usually it you know you see it a lot with guys who will get into the sport and go really hard and make a lot of crazy progress for the first year and they hit that first injury mm -hmm. and it you see a lot of guys who have I mean potential doesn't exist 
It's a concept that we do to fill in what I what we think someone will eventually be capable of. But potential means nothing if you get hit by a bus tomorrow. <laughs> so you can't you can't celebrate the progress you haven't actually made yet. You can't celebrate the lifts that you haven't achieved yet. You can use that as a gauge of this is where I think we can get to. Let's do our best to carry it out. But like I was saying earlier, no one plans to get hurt. No one's like, I'm going to do a 12-week block. This is how I'm going to set it up. Here's my volume. Here's where the exercise selection. Six weeks in, I'm going to tear some stuff up. It's going to be <laughs> awful. I'm going to feel horrible about my life and go to a deep state of depression and have to find out how important this is to me. And is it worth, uh, is it worth spending hours and hours a day rehabbing to, to come back to be able to start celebrating you know, post-injury PRs? Is that worth it to me? Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that a lot of guys, if you haven't experienced that yet, it's, it's really tough to say, right? It's something that, I, again, I don't wish injury on anybody, but sometimes you have to, you have to mess up bad enough to, to kind of teach yourself the lesson of the, really? the most successful people in the sport are the people who are able to do it for the longest and avoid injury for as long as possible. Yeah, it works. David Briggs, but yeah, there's a few of them like that, Anthony Harris or whatever. Yeah. Listen, we've had you for an hour and a half, man. Appreciate it. Um, I'm sure. We're going to go hit some weights. I know you're going to hit some weights, too. Of course. Uh, yeah. uh, so if we can have you on again um, sometime, maybe closer to the Nationals, that'd be great. Randy, you got a question for him? So we ask every lifter that comes on here the, the same question. When it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered in the sport? Yes, I feel sort of like like I like I had said that I, I sort of stand as the representation, or I I consider myself the guy who stands up for people who is just a normal guy who who loves something enough that they are willing to just work on it for the long haul and put and put themselves fully into that pursuit. Uh, I I guess I just want to be remembered as as a guy who who gave his best regardless of his circumstances and i want to add enrichment to the lives of the lifters that i am in contact with or that i encounter and uh, i'm i'm not obsessed with everybody having to like me but i want to make sure that no matter where i go away from this that i i gave what I could to this sport that's given me so much. And so I, I guess I'd like to be remembered as the the guy who, who showed a few others that it's possible to go beyond what people thought their potential was. Well said, sir. Well, have a good training day. We'll be watching for you at the U.S. Raw Nationals, and we'll keep you in touch. Sounds great. You guys have a great one. Thanks, Thanks. Rick. Thanks for coming on. Of course. Well spoke, sir. Pretty good interview. The guy's been around 2000, for a young guy, he's 27. You know, his interview, there's the youth and the people that have been a long time will appreciate it. I think the youth, like, maybe won't take as much out of it, but there's a lot of people that'll go along with what he said. Like, there's, he, he's a smart guy. Mm-hmm. He does read a lot. Like, there's a lot of stuff he's into. But the, he used words that ain't no. But the, yeah, the, have to go and the, look the, it up. The spiritual side of it, you know what I mean? Like, that's what he's into, the meditation, all that other stuff. But he's just on a, it's like you said, everybody's so different. Yeah. You know, and his was, his is just, it's, that's an interesting way to go about <laughs> it, though. The aggression, you don't see, like, not, not saying he isn't aggressive in how he lifts, but just the aggression's not behind it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, some people are emotionally invested. Some people do it methodically. Analytically, and in terms of what works, fuck, man, we've seen it all, right? But, you know, when we keep going to these different lifters, and the, the other thing I like about some of these youth guys, well, like younger guys that we see on here, people think they're breakout. You know what I mean? They're breakout freaks and natures. Yeah, 10 years in the game, both of them, or more. They've more lifted since he was 10. Yeah, that's crazy. 10. Yeah. You know, like. And he was competing 2005. He says since 97. Which, um, before the IPF was raw, and he was doing, like, like and, and yeah. like IPF wasn't nearly as big. Um, so, and there was so many, I remember those days, and there were so many other 
federations That's around. That's what he said about the IPF, though, eh? That was the one you went to if you wanted strict judging and your total will go down. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, and the days changed, man. The, like, social media was around, yada, yada. It was just a whole other ballgame back in the day. There's so many federations. I think those federations are still around now, but they were, now they're, like, almost completely dried up. But at the time, they were, like, strong, thriving feds that offered different, like, actual raw lifting, um, and the IPF wasn't, but it's obviously good for the sport, the IPF went raw, because that's what the boom happened, and then social media, our sport is made for social media, so then, boom, the boom happened at the exact same time, social media, like, Instagram and all that started really taking off, and the IPF went raw, it's just, like, the perfect situation, all of us jump left those other feds and kind of call out oh, yeah i mean like a lot of those other feds get eaten up or whatever along the way or just, just lost dis talent. dissolved and stuff like that yeah, exactly lost the talent so the but in a way it, i it's a good thing too sometimes though because the more everything becomes you know the same judging the same thing like because you see some of the some of these like some feds it's not it's not even close mm. right so i mean it, it, that's the interesting part. I, I like that some of it does get eaten up, some of them disappear because some of them are so shitty they just give the sport a bad name. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they had their per like back in the day. Yeah. They had their purpose. Uh, like I always believed in unequipped lifting, right? And I knew that it was like the public would rally behind unequipped lifting more than equipped lifting because just visually it looks funny. You walk in and you can't put your arms down for a bench or whatever. Yeah. Have, right. So it's good. Anyways, you could do a whole fucking show talking about that. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's a good one. I gotta go. I gotta smash this Lenny and Larry's cookie and hit some weights and YouTube. Peace. Later. Well.